Leadership is about managing energy, first in yourself and then in others. My passion is, is to help leaders learn to manage their energy, manage their presence. And that, by the way, also happens to be the secret of accessing higher creativity. Welcome to the Seismic Shift podcast. I am super excited to introduce you to our guest today, Michael Gelb. He's a freaking rock star. You want to know why? He has written 17 books. He's a best-selling author. He's an authority on genius thinking and how it applies to human growth and personal development. He has written 17 books that have been translated into 25 different languages. They cumulatively have sold over a million copies. And when I was getting to know Michael and the reason why I'm so excited to have him on our podcast today is because he really is an expert on two brilliant concepts. Number one, creativity and number two, connection. So you can understand why he is a natural fit for the seismic shift in leadership. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. So I'm really interested, right? So I'm on a mission to help leaders create cultures of connection to drive results. So we're going to, I'm going to want to talk and really pick your brain all about connection. You are a leading authority. I want to first begin with your genius thinking, putting your genius thinking cap on. I have concluded what one of the biggest seismic shifts is right now, and that's what I talk about. I want to know what seismic shifts you're observing. What's happening? What are you seeing? As a fan of your wonderful work and the brilliant concept of thinking in terms of seismic shifts and how do we manage them and how do we deepen our ability to connect and be creative in the face of whatever big change is, is, is taking place. I did, I did reflect on the course of my career, which is now <laughs> looking at 50 years of working with people around the world. So I, I, I still think that the, the most important seismic shift is one I, I really was one of the first ones that took place at the beginning of my career, which was the emergence of women in business and leadership. Uh, I did my first corporate seminar in 1979. And for the first probably five or six years that I was teaching, it was all men in every group. There would be a woman, she'd be the HR person outside the room or the secretary literally sharpening the pencils. <laughs> it's so wild to think about it because I think a lot of you know, a lot of people just take it for granted now. But when I think about the most important and significant shift, because I'm sure most people come on, talk about technology, everything's getting faster. We all know about that. Uh, but I remember, so here's the funny thing too, is uh, I didn't used to ever say this out loud, but it's another, it's another really seismic shift, is right from the beginning, my vision was, to bring more of divine feminine wisdom into a top-down, hierarchical, out-of-balance workplace. And I was teaching receptivity and connection and the importance of relationships, first to these groups of all guys. And it was, I was able to get away with it because I could kind of bond with them and, and, but that was my Trojan horse secret. I was getting in the walls of the city in order to teach these notions that were fairly heretical that you might occasionally be receptive. <laughs> you might occasionally really listen and be empathic and that caring was really important. So for me, the seismic shift that is most profound is within about 10 years, the majority of my clients were women. And more important even than whether they were women or, or men, more important than the gender is this 
this harmonization of these universal principles of yin and yang has become something that's much, you know, we can talk about this openly and freely. So the discourse has changed, the consciousness has changed, and that shift of consciousness is probably the biggest seismic shift in the course of my almost 50 years career. I love it. Which brings me to my next question. Please share with our listeners your story. How in the world did you get involved and and with your passions of, of creativity, genius thinking, and, and connection? Well, it's, it's really because I saw suffering on every level, globally, and I, I grew up at a time of incredible divisiveness, kind of like now. Uh, it was the Vietnam War, race riots. There were the National Guard came to my high school once. And, you know, we had had uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Martin Luther King. So these are very visceral, profound experiences. Plus, I was born. It was just seven years after the Holocaust. And I was trying to process how something like that ever could have happened in the heart of so-called Western civilization. So I was, I was, and, and plus I was blessed. Uh, my, my dad was a healer. He was an oral surgeon. My mom was a healer. She was a psych psychologist. We used to call them mental and dental. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they were both, it never occurred to me to do anything that wasn't healing for the world. But I also had enough self-awareness you know, I had to do something that I would love to do. Uh, so I started to study psychology, uh, thought it was fascinating, but it was too academic. It wasn't integrated enough in practice. I studied philosophy, fascinating, loved it, still do, but it was too much in the mind and not integrated into action. So I, I, I got, I, when I was 20, I went on a 10-month intensive course to study in a practical way the spiritual traditions of the world. So I learned Buddhist meditation from a Buddhist monk. I learned Sufi zikr from Sufi masters. Uh, I had an amazing, unbelievable opportunity and saw what Aldous Huxley calls the perennial philosophy, the universal fundamental teaching uh, of which is really comes down to love. And so then I was 21. I said, okay, well, now what? Because <laughs> I wasn't the type of person to go off into a mountain or be an ascetic. It's like, okay, what do I do in the world? And I, I found my way. Uh, uh, I trained as a teacher of the Alexander Technique, which is a method for developing stage presence. And that led to me getting invited to speak at this corporate seminar in 1979. And the head of HR for that company said, we want this young American on all of our courses around the world. So I was 27 years old, flying all over the world, teaching people twice my age. Now I fly all over the world. And I teach people half my age. <laughs> so that's how it really got started. I love it. Okay, so creativity and connection. And, you know, I, I just want to fit what I'm really trying to do is figure out the elements of a culture of connection, because I'm trying to tell my leaders that I work with anybody who will listen. We have got to create cultures of connection. I just came back from London and the th thinkers 50. And that's what we were all going. We all concluded that it's time to go back to the basics. We were so hard charging with results, 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 results that I think we just lost focus. And we've got to go back to the basics of human connection. So if you could wave a magic wand, what, what are the elements of a culture of connection? What does that look like, sound like, feel like to you who's a true expert in connection? Yeah, well, it's, it's really fundamental, timeless wisdom. And it's shifting out of chronological, you know, the Greeks called it chronos. And that's the time mentality where tick, 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 tick deliverables by such and such a date 
You're, we're holding you accountable. Here are the co negative consequences. Here's the bonus you will get. Tick, 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 tick. So that is, that's, and well, look, we need that world. That's a world that of efficiency. And without that, we'd be lost. So we, we have to be really good at that. I, I'm really good at that. I'm always on time. I have never been late in my whole career and I finish on time. So I respect Kronos and respect the, it's a tool for operating in this world. But the, the secret of connection is Kairos. It's nonlinear time. It's full and complete presence where we connect with what is timeless and precious and soulful in every being. Now, the really cool news is it doesn't take a lot of chronological time to do that if you have the internal wherewithal to really show up. And you know, I was really blessed to learn that from CEOs that I coached way back in the 80s, because the people who hired me were not you know, crazy, hard charging, scorch the earth, exploit the worker types. The people who hired me were visionary, humanistic, creative types. And I watched, I watched my clients, first of all, a lot of them rise up to become the CEO of major enterprises. But then I noticed that they always had time for everyone, that they would be, I mean, there's one, one, uh, one leader was the, uh, he was the CEO of the uh, Detroit Pistons. And Wherever we, I was walking through their, their old complex before they moved. I was walking through their old complex and we stopped for a coffee and they have, you know, a barista in there. He connects with the barista and not just, Hey, how you doing? But remembered something about that person's life. And I think it was something to do with their kid or something. And he asked him about it. And you watch, you watch the people light up, uh, because, you know, the big cheese, is not, has the proverbial common touch, which comes from really, real genuine humility. Uh, genuine humility, which is the same root as human, and also, by the way, humor, because there's also time for a laugh. And that takes, that transforms all the energy. So, you know, the other really huge seismic shift, which relates to what we're talking about, is the shift from time management, which was every other seminar besides mine on creativity and innovation. When I started was time management. They gave you those little you know, binder things to take. Well, now it's energy management and attention management. And you can't manage those things outside of yourself without managing them within. So for, for more than 10 years, I was lucky enough to co-teach a seminar at University of Virginia in Darden Graduate School of Business uh, called Leading Innovation. And I co-taught this with Professor Jim Clausen, who wrote this fabulous book called Level 3 Leadership. And the opening line of the book is, leadership is about managing energy, first in yourself and then in others. So my passion is, is to help Leaders learn to manage their energy, manage their presence. And that, by the way, also happens to be the secret of accessing higher creativity. Oh, that is so cool. Because when I was trying to figure out what connection looks like, feels like, sounds like from a leadership perspective, when I was researching for my book, I realized that it was at three levels in order for a leader to be successful. They needed connection with themselves true, genuine connection with themselves in order to connect with others, in order to connect strategically with the organization. And I'll never forget sitting down with one of the CEOs I interviewed. And I said, I really help me understand how to connect with your 40,000 employees. How do you do that? And he said, well, connection with the organization really is about how you manage your calendar. And he said, if your calendar owns you, that's a problem. 
You have to own your calendar and you as the leader have to figure out who are your key stakeholders that will allow you to be successful. How often do you have to meet with them? And you have to embed time to be creative. You have to embed time to strategically think. And that to me was a huge, that was a big aha moment. I had not looked at connection through that lens. That's, you got it. And uh, I, so as I think, you know, I wrote this book called The Art of Connection. And the motto of that book, uh, I like to make up, when I make up a motto, I put it in Latin because it sounds more impressive. <laughs> so the motto of that book is, Conjungere ad solvendum, which means connect before solving. So before we get transactional, before we say, okay, give me the numbers, let's solve the problem, let's do the business, we ask somebody with genuine presence how they're doing. And we take a moment to be in rapport. I mean, some, you know, some cultures, they take a few hours to do that before they get down to business. Here, we tend to be, boom, boom, let's go. Give me the details. Let's go. Uh, so here, it's getting people to just slow down a little bit and make that connection. With some of my clients from other cultures, it's like, okay, let's keep it moving. <laughs> so it's always a balance. I love how you... It's always a balance. And I love how you talk about, you know, true, genuine presence and that shifting from chronological time, right, to just meaningful presence. So if you look at you and I both are executive coaches, we, we help leaders and organizations, right? And, and so if you look at culture, how would you embed connection in, in, yeah. in a company's culture? First of all, that's a, a con it depends on the company. It depends on their circumstances. But there, there's some fundamentals that still haven't changed with all the seismic shifts. And one of them is that actually showing up in person and connecting with people when, when the senior people actually do that and are good at that and are not just transactional. And when they when I if I can embed conjungere ad salvendum into their DNA, that's going to that's going to really make a difference in the culture. I've been exploring different ways to bring people together and have fun. And joy. I mean, fun is even the joy to experience joy and delight and learning together and things that just just help everyone feel connected, but in a good way and not in a heavy handed way, because you know, I find too many team building exercises are invasive or they're stressful. Like, Please don't make me do a scavenger hunt. Uh, or put on a show or something. I mean, it's just, uh, that's already too much like my job. I want to do something that's fun and different and see a different side of people. So I've been passionate about ways of doing that. You know, I, I developed, uh, I, it's a book I wrote. It's called Wine Drinking for Inspired Thinking. And I've been leading wine tasting and poetry programs for my clients for decades and decades. And what's, you know, some of these, without a couple of glasses of wine, you'll never get through to these people. <laughs> but then the soul emerges and they write poetry and, and they're really, they're in awe that the person from accounting, the person from IT has this poetic soul that they didn't even know about. And then you see somebody differently and that, that translates into an ineffable shift that makes a more human connected, connected culture. So, and there's lots and lots more, but these are just some of the things that I've created to facilitate that kind of connected culture. I think you're onto something. Surprise, surprise. And one of the things is, is laughter and levity. I want to bring back laughter and levity into the workplace. I just feel like it just left the building a long time ago. And, and now it's starting to creep back in now that people are going back into the office and they're realizing, oh my gosh, I like other humans. I, I not only like other humans, 
I can laugh and gosh, is laughter good for the soul. So I think that's one of the elements I'm figuring out as far as a culture of connection is laughter and levity. But, you know, it's, but it's a strange, a strange and challenging time because part of what has killed humor, which is, you know, the ha- aha and the ha ha are first cousins. So humor and creativity really do go hand in hand. It's the same process in the mind. And leaving aside the whole pandemic and all that, that craziness and leaving aside political polarization. You have people walking on eggshells because they're afraid they're going to say something wrong and make a joke that's in bad taste and somebody's going to feel uncomfortable and be. And so it's hard. It, it That has been a, a negative seismic shift that we need to, to figure a way around. I mean, I'm one has to be quite discerning in where one is and what one says in any given time. And jokes that might have been really funny to some group a while ago, you say the same thing now and you're canceled. You're dead. Uh, so, so that it requires great sensitivity, but the danger is people throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. They say, well, I'm not, we're never going to have any more fun again. We can't kid around. We can't have fun because everybody's too serious and too tight, uptight and too miserable. And, and it's a, that's a nightmare. Yeah, you're right. There are a lot of pressures on leaders right now, and they don't know whether to speak or not to speak or what to speak about. That's all, you know, that doesn't have to do with business. You're absolutely right. It's a, it's a conundrum and it is a, it, it's, it's a dance, you know, and you have to be highly, I think, emotionally intelligent, um, in order to figure that dance out. So I do agree. So if we can figure out how to inject laughter and levity at work without offending people, <laughs> that, thing, that is, that is the secret laughing. song. You're, we're both laughing because when you say that, we, there's a incongruity. <laughs> well, we all know, you know, right. you know, the, the, the people who used to come into the office, did you hear about the blah, 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 blah. And you're like cringing going, no, no you can't tell no. me. You don't I mean, it's just, you just, yeah. So right. particular thing. So I don't mean, you know, more like telling jokes. No, no, it's I just know. being able to <laughs> laugh, you know? And one of the things you said earlier, when I asked about seismic shift, I want to explore a little bit more is, is, is I love how you were just so honest, like Michelle, one of the greatest seismic shifts is the women in the workplace. Like when I started, it was, they sharpened pencils and, and now there are, you know, more women than men in undergraduate programs, in business schools and MBAs and medical schools and law schools. It's really quite remarkable and they're outperforming academically. I mean, you see it all the time as far as women and it, it's still, it can still be challenging. When I deliver speeches on connection to all female audiences, I tell them that I didn't, when I was researching my book on connection, it didn't ever occur to me that the characteristics needed right now are much more of the feminine characteristics, empathy, compassion, creating a positive, kind culture, seeing the person as a whole person and not just the results they bring to the organization. And so I tell women, I say, now is your time. Now is our time to lean in because for years, Michael, and again, thank goodness you're so sensitive. You have a fantastic wife and you've done all this great research and you're, you're super sensitive to, to, to what femininity brings into workspaces. And, and as a woman, I can say, and the women that I talked to is for years, we, we suppressed many of us, our natural qualities, um, in order to act more like men, because that's what was going to be successful. So I'm just so appreciative at this day and age. Again, what we're finding is, is the qualities of compassion and kindness and, um, and listening skills and other centeredness and servant leadership. That's what we're finding is, is necessary right now to be successful. So that's a beautiful thing. Amen. Or a women. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Okay. I want to hear about, you're so good about thinking because I can tell you put a lot of thought. Okay. What seismic shifts are out there? And I would love to know, since you are somebody who has a growth mindset, you're always learning, you're always improving, you're super creative, entrepreneurial. 
What seismic shift are you working on for yourself right now? It's not uh, sort of cosmic or big global paradigm shift. It's just, it's more personal related to my passion of the moment, which is the book I'm, I'm writing, which I'm almost finished with, which is going to come out next September and the new seminar and the new keynote that I'm evolving. That is the metaphor. It's a metaphor, but it's actually an instructional book. Uh, it, it's called Walking Well. Do tell, do tell. It's, it's really about, first of all, how to just literally walk more comfortably uh, with greater ease, how to get more energy from every step that you take. And then it moves into uh, getting people to walk together. You know, uh, uh, Salvitor Ambulando, it is solved by walking. It's, it's the Greeks were the peripatetic school. It means they walked around to philosophy. So I'm, I'm the paradigm shift that I'm working on is getting people out of the, the Zoom room or the office and, and to walk together in nature because the profound effects on every level for, for transforming your workplace, for making a culture of connection. So one of the CEOs who I coach, who's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And it's funny because he's in the, he's in, talk about a seismic shift. He's in the earthquake insurance business. <laughs> <laughs> and he literally just moved his company's headquarters to a place that has walking paths all around it. And he did it intentionally because of how important he thinks it is for people to be able to get outside of the office, especially having us all gotten through this pandemic time and walk in nature, which he does with different people at different levels of his company. And it's a way of connecting that's just much more effective and joyful and soulful and natural than sitting at a conference table or just being on a Zoom face to face. Oh, gosh, there are so many opportunities here for discussion. Number one, I remember when I was trying to figure out, OK, how should we meet differently? You know, when coming out of the pandemic, I, I tried to just coach all of my leaders to disrupt everything, rethink everything, your entire life, not your life choices and your life partners. And, but I mean, but how you show up as a human, you know, how you show up as a friend, how you show up as a teammate, as a leader, how you show up in your workplace and the work environment, like let's disrupt everything. And, and one of the things I was finding, I would ask like, what are the best ways right now to, to, to meet and to connect. And people would say, well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm saying, Hey, you want to meet? Well, then let's walk. And I've got New Yorkers saying, meet me in Central Park. I've got, I live in New Orleans, uptown New Orleans, meet me in the park and, and let's walk. And what your research is showing, not only does it connect you, but it also unleashes creativity, right? And there is something also about shoulder to shoulder, not face to face, which makes it safer safer to really talk, you know, talk about psychological safety. I was with just in London with Amy Edmondson, um, who coined psychological safety. And, and, and that is the essence. You have to have that foundation in order to have innovation and creativity. So I love the whole walking concept. And, and I hope, um, I hope we can, we can really nudge and, and move the needle on this because maybe in the workplace, people are still a little bit resistant. I wish to good. I love the CEO that you just mentioned. Like when you think about where you want your workplace to be, can it have walking paths? Why not? You know, again, that's rethinking how we show up. I'll never forget. I did an interview with the global president of Kind Bars, Juan Martin, right when the pandemic was ending. And he said they were redoing their entire offices so that it was all collaborative, that you couldn't go in and shut your door and hide behind your computer. That it is. So when you showed up, then now there's an expectation to work collaboratively and sit collaboratively. So that's what, that's what we're both talking about is, is how to connect and how to collaborate and, and how to do things differently, right? In order to build a culture of work that is, that is more positive, that's more inspiring, that's more creative, that's more human. Amen. So that's, that's what makes people want to come to work. And obviously there's no substitute for having some kind of higher purpose in your work. 
that makes a difference and serves humanity and isn't just about garnering capital. Uh, so that that's the other missing link is a higher purpose. It's amazing how a higher purpose raises everybody's energy, generates esprit de corps, because you can do all the juggling, all the walking, all the wonderful meditation and stuff. But if if you're if you're exploiting people and if you're extracting, there's something fundamentally doesn't feel right. And why do you know? And here's the other thing we now know that if you care for all your stakeholders, if you have a higher purpose, if you have a culture of connection, if you're focused on alleviating suffering and elevating joy through whatever your product or service is, you'll make more money. Mike Trump, once yeah. you know that, once you stop resisting <laughs> that notion and lean in and say, okay, okay, let's try it, man. The ROI is just almost going to be like immeasurable, limitless. That's what I believe. That's the seismic shift. And you said it beautifully and you summarized beautifully. So Michael, if people want to know more about you and your work and what you do, where should they go? michaelgelb.com, G-E-L-B, michaelgelb.com. Sign up for our free newsletter. We have a, we send you a gift that teaches you how to do mind mapping, which is the methodology I've used to write those 17 previous books. And it's, it's the one I've used to write this new one. Uh, it's one of the methodologies for generating your creative mind and integrating yin and yang in your ability to think, plan, and solve problems. Mm, I love it. Thank you so much for being on the Seismic Shift podcast. You were a delight. And thank you to all of our listeners out there. We hope that you are managing, addressing, and embracing all of the seismic shifts in your world and that every day you get to show up as the best version of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Seismic Shift. And before you go, can I ask one favor of you? Do you mind sharing today's episode with a leader you know? The power of this conversation is found in your using it and sharing it to create real connection in your life. Lastly, I'd like to thank Loyola University, New Orleans and the Terra Firma audio team for helping bring this content to life.